Welcome to the Russian Rulers History Podcast, Episode 89, Jockeying for Position. Well, before I get started, I want to say a couple things. First, I want to say thank you to Mike Duncan, The History of Rome. Today was his last podcast in his series, over 170 podcasts over a five-year period of a narrative about the history of Rome that got me excited about doing the history of Russia. Mike, you went with me on a lot of walks on Monday mornings with my dog through the woods, listening to your incredible story about Roman history. Thank you very much. Secondly, during the time off I've just had, this podcast celebrated its second anniversary on April 30th. I really want to thank all of my listeners. I just look at the statistics when I download them and just am amazed at how many of you are following this podcast. And I just hope that it brings you a little bit of joy like it does to me every week. Thank you for all of you listening. In the last two episodes, we witnessed the end of the last Soviet ruler to be executed in Lavrentia Beria. Only in office about a hundred days, he was double-crossed by Nikita Khrushchev, who thought he was going to oust Malenkov. Also, we heard the so-called secret speech given by Khrushchev denouncing the actions of Joseph Stalin and his cult of personality. Now, I think we need to summarize who was in charge of the USSR after the removal of Beria. Well, you have Vyacheslav Molotov, and he was the foreign minister. Next, you have Georgi Malenkov, and he was the chairman of the Council of Ministers. Nikita Khrushchev was the first secretary of the Communist Party. Down the road a little bit. Then there were the Politburo members, whose numbers were shrunk after Stalin died, to kind of get rid of all those young Stalinists who had threatened the old guard. Now, the old guard included men like Lazar Kaganovich, Nicholas Bulganin, Anastas Mikoyan, Mikhail Porufkin and Clement Voroshilov. So basically, these are the men who collectively controlled and ran the Soviet Union starting in July of 1953 when Beria was ousted. But now the machinations and the backroom deals were just starting to get hot. Khrushchev was to dominate things, as was evident after a secret speech to the 20th Congress in 1956. While Khrushchev began to attempt to gather and expand his power base, a number of conservatives led by Molotov began to crumble. That was in 1956 here. But before we get into that, let's step back a bit and follow the events from 1953 to 1956. Now, the first standoff, so to say, for power after Beria's removal was between Georgi Malenkov and Nikita Khrushchev which started in March of 1953, immediately after Stalin's death. On March 23rd, concerned about any one man ever having too much power, Malenkov was forced to relinquish his position as the head of the secretariat, a position that was later handled or handed to Khrushchev, and this was done by the entire Presidium. Now, if you were a betting man in June of 1953, you would have given even money on Malenkov ending up on the upside of the power struggle. Khrushchev? Uh, I would have given him five to one odds. But if you had inside information, you would have cleaned up as Malenkov had a big problem as he was unable to change the way he played the behind the scenes intrigue games within the Kremlin walls. He felt that he could use the same tactics that he used while Stalin was around which, of course, was a big mistake. Another error in his ways was his promise to the Russian people to increase the Soviet economic focus on consumer goods while lessening the focus on heavy industry. While this might have been popular with the people, what Malenkov failed to realize was the inherent vested special interest groups like the military that were opposed to such changes. While appealing to the masses, this made him more enemies than friends in the Presidium hierarchy, which the more cunning Khrushchev was to take advantage of. Now, if you just judge them by their personalities alone, Khrushchev had it all over his rival. 
while far less educated, Khrushchev had a way with people. And according to his friend Alexei Ajubai, after Stalin's death, quote, Khrushchev changed, even externally. He became more self-assured, more dynamic. His very manner of speaking had changed. He sounded much more independent. Well, the man who under Stalin was considered adult was anything but one. I mean, Beria once quoted as, was once quoted as saying that Nikita was a fat, clumsy, red-mugged fool who he, past master of intrigue Beria, could wrap around his finger. Well, even though Khrushchev was deeply involved with the plot to remove Beria, the others in the Presidium continued to underestimate him. By September of 1953, he was named First Secretary, a position he was to use to consolidate power, much like Stalin did in the 1920s. Now, William Taubman, in his Pulitzer Prize-winning biography on Khrushchev, wondered whether there should ever have been a split in competition between Malenkov and Nikita. Writing about Malenkov, he says, quote, But was his clash with Khrushchev inevitable? Malenkov was no superman, but he had strengths that complemented Khrushchev's. Khrushchev was impulsive. Malenkov was steadier. Khrushchev craved the limelight. Malenkov might have settled for a lesser role. And they certainly had aims in common, especially in agricultural and foreign policy, and they were as close personally as any Presidium members could be. Well, the inevitable answer to the question was egos. Malenkov, even though he didn't crave the, the limelight, he didn't like how Khrushchev constantly hogged the spotlight. And Nikita, he had a deep-seated dislike of Georgie despite outward appearances. Add to that, as Malenko's former son-in-law, Vladimir Schomburg, said, quote, it was common knowledge that Molotov, Kaganovich, and other members of the Presidium hated Malenkov. Khrushchev began to make his way around the Soviet Union to increase his power and prestige. Molotov writes, quote, Khrushchev traveled to the provinces a lot, to collective and state farms, and you can't fault him for this. This was precisely his positive quality. He was everywhere. Stables, boilers, etc. He met with simple workers and peasants, more than Lenin or Stalin did. There's no denying that. People were at ease with him. They treated him as one of their own. Malenkov then made a major blunder in November of 1953, when at a party meeting he threatened to remove corrupt officials. As Taubman so deftly puts it, quote, His speech was greeted by the silence of the grave, as incomprehension blended with confusion, confusion with fear, and fear with indignation. At that point, Khrushchev's voice rang out, all that, of course, is true, Georgi Maximilianovich. But still, the apparat is our foundation. At that, the hall exploded with enthusiastic applause. Khrushchev was also blunt with his assessment of the Soviet economy, especially agriculturally. He is quoted as saying, Comrades, this is already the 38th year of Soviet power. That's not a short amount of time. That means we should be ashamed to keep blaming Nicholas II. The man's been dead for a long time. Members at the meeting laughed. At another meeting he said, The people put it to us this way. Will there be meat to eat or not? Will there be milk or not? Will there be decent pairs of pants? This isn't ideology, of course. But what good does it do if everyone is ideologically correct but goes around without trousers? Laughter ensued, along with applause. You can see how Khrushchev was able to deftly communicate easily with his audiences. In 1954, 
Khrushchev came up with an idea, which was later to be proved as disastrous, although early on it reaped great rewards. This was to develop what they called the virgin lands. They were going to develop them agriculturally to stem the tide of hunger throughout the USSR. These lands were in Kazakhstan and Siberia. The Kazakh party leader, Sher Kometov, objected, saying, Kazakhstan is for sheep, not for grain. The virgin lands mustn't be developed. Khrushchev then quickly replaced Shayab Kometov with Pantelemon Ponomarenko and made Leonid Brezhnev his deputy. An order was sent to develop 13 million hectares within two years by rallying 300,000 Komsomol volunteers to head to the virgin lands. What wasn't thought out fully was the reallocation of machinery from the regularly cultivated lands of the south to the new areas. This caused the inability to work and harvest the lands that not only were traditionally counted on to support the country, but it was the most fertile land, something that the virgin lands were certainly not. Another problem with the new lands was the unpredictable weather. It could go through long periods, sometimes years, of very low rainfall, which meant a boom or bust type of living for the newly arrived and inconsistencies in grain delivery for the rest of the country. Molotov was the first to openly object to the use of the virgin lands, calling the project absurd. In his autobiography, Molotov said of Khrushchev at that period, Khrushchev was so carried away that he was like a runaway horse or like a cattle dealer, a small-time cattle dealer, without doubt a man of little culture, a cattle trader, a man who sells livestock. Khrushchev, for his part, countered with attacks on Molotov, where he told the plenum, Molotov didn't once visit the collective farm next door to his private dacha. He intimated to his comrades that Molotov was so far removed from the people that he had completely lost touch with them. Still, the two remained allies while they worked on ousting the man they mutually disliked, Malenkov. In the background, Khrushchev had his hand-picked KGB head, Ivan Serov, begin to privately blackmail Malenkov over his role in the Leningrad affair which cost the lives of Kuznetsov and Vozhensky, among others. By April 1954, the Supreme Court of the USSR posthumously rehabilitated all those falsely accused in the Leningrad affair, which Malenkov had a lot to do with. Khrushchev by now had the backing of Molotov, Bolganin, Kaganovich, Voroshilov, and Mikoyan. He began to populate the party offices with men who were allies of his. So when Khrushchev went to Beijing to celebrate the fifth anniversary of the People's Republic of China, Malenkov was safely left behind in Moscow. By the plenum of January, he began to publicly denounce Malenkov. He accused Malenkov of being Beria's right-hand man. Molotov jumped in and added, Lavrenti and Georgi, Georgi and Lavrenti, they were always together drinking, riding at the same car, at each other's dachas. The plenum then drafted a resolution that implicated Malenkov in the Leningrad affair, and Khrushchev blamed Malenkov for Beria's ill-thought-out plan to let go of East Germany. If this had been Stalin's time, Malenkov would have been liquidated. Under the new regime, he was merely removed from power. Over the years, he was moved further and further away from the center of power. Eventually, he became a devout member of the Russian Orthodox Church. And when he died, he was a reader in the church, an important yet lower position. Some have written that the removal from power and his subsequent rediscovering religion was a relief for a man so close to the pinnacle of power. Next in Khrushchev's crosshairs was Stalin's longtime right-hand man, Molotov, good old stone arse. Initially, the two men respected each other, 
with Khrushchev being careful around Molotov, especially when it came to foreign policy matters. But that changed in 1954, when Khrushchev wanted to improve relations with Marshal Tito of Yugoslavia, someone Stalin wanted dead, and Molotov, being Molotov, followed his boss's lead, even after his death. There were two main reasons why Khrushchev decided to try a rapprochement with Yugoslavia. One, to correct what was considered a policy mistake on Stalin's part, and the second, to begin the process of undermining Molotov. He knew that Stone Arse would show strong opinions about not repairing relations with Tito, as he was the main architect of the split between Belgrade and Moscow, under orders from Stalin, of course. Molotov wanted the Yugoslavs to come to Moscow, but Khrushchev said that they shouldn't, quote, come begging with their hats in their hands. So off to Yugoslavia they went. Only Molotov didn't come along. Khrushchev led the way and helped ease the tensions in May of 1955. According to Taubman, quote, Molotov's complaint that the Presidium decided Yugoslav issues in his absence prompted this profound exchange. It was just an exchange during a Presidium meeting between Molotov and, Kros and Khrushchev. Khrushchev, we told you before you left. Molotov, what I said is a fact. Khrushchev, what we're saying is a fact. The question of whether Molotov deviated from the party line triggered this colloquy. Khrushchev, you are against. Molotov, I expressed my point of view. Khrushchev, flashing the biting humor that was a strong source of his appeal. All the sword soldiers are out of step. Turns out, only Molotov is in step. From here, others began to jump on the bash Molotov bandwagon. Malenkov, who was still at that time trying to get back in Khrushchev's good graces, helped pound Molotov in revenge for his bashing. Kaganovich backed Khrushchev by saying, Comrade Khrushchev carries out his work intensively, steadfastly, actively, and enterprisingly, as befits a Leninist Bolshevik and Central Committee First Secretary. The butt-kissing was just getting started. Molotov knew he was in trouble, which caused him to backtrack. Quote, I consider the Presidium has correctly pointed out the error of my position on the Yugoslav question. I shall work honestly and actively to correct my mistake. To which Khrushchev replied, For thirty-four years he sat in the Politburo, and then for ten years he talks nonsense. Why don't you retire? We'll give you a good pension. We'll respect you, but don't interfere with our work. Another issue that Khrushchev jumped on was the way that Molotov seemed to be totally out of touch with the sufferings of the Russian people. Stalin was infatuated with massive government buildings, showing off to the rest of the world. Khrushchev remembered a comment that Stalin had made. What will happen if visitors walk around Moscow and find no skyscrapers? They will make unfavorable comparisons with capitalist cities. The problem was that the people were forced to live in rotten conditions, even in Moscow. Two or three families were forced to live in one small apartment. Stalin didn't care, but Khrushchev did. So when Molotov reported to the Presidium that the people were upset with the living conditions, Khrushchev mocked him by saying, He'd have thought he'd been born only yesterday. He acted as though he'd just learned that people were living in overcrowded, vermin-infested, intolerable conditions, often two families to a room. At the end of a speech denouncing Molotov, Khrushchev complained about Molotov and his wife, Polina Zemchuzina, and the pairs welcoming the American ambassador to their home. That's incorrect. Even scandalous, Khrushchev said. We, members of the Presidium, don't receive foreign correspondence without the Presidium's permission. And here's a minister's wife opening a private diplomatic shop and receives anyone who strikes her fancy. You're the Minister of Foreign Affairs, but your wife isn't your deputy. I have to tell you, Vyacheslav Mikhailovich, 
that she does you a disservice, your wife. Many years later, though, Khrushchev was to be denounced for bringing his wife, Nina Petrovna, on foreign trips. But now is it was his time to put the screws on his opponents. Molotov was still on the Presidium, but his influence was greatly diminished after this bashing by Nikita. Khrushchev now turned to finally dismissing the influence of Stalin at the 20th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party, which started on February 14, 1956. Now, I've already read an abridged version of the speech given by the First Secretary, but if you haven't heard it, Go back and listen to it now, because it's really important to hear the words of Nikita Khrushchev at that time. What started it all, though, were the first words Khrushchev said to start the meeting. Quote, In the period between the 19th and 20th Congresses, we have lost distinguished leaders of the communist movement. Joseph Zaryanovich Stalin, Clement Gottwald, and Kayuchi Takuda, I ask everyone to honor their memory by standing. The attending delegates were stunned. As the Italian communist Vittoria Vidali recalled, we looked at one another in surprise. Why? Who was Takuda? What a strange tribute this was. Made in such a hurry. It was almost as if he were afraid of the dead or ashamed to mention them. Vidali may not have understood what was going on, but the Presidium, and in particular Khrushchev, did. They were there to tear down the man who had controlled everything before, Stalin. The Congress was completely planned out, and over the next ten days of meetings, things were slowly taking apart the cult of the individual, laying the groundwork for never letting one man take that kind of control again. While men like Mikoyan talked of the time of Stalin negatively, a letter from Mao Zedong praised the late leader, which caused the delegates to burst into applause. It was on the tenth and final day that the secret speech was given to a stunned audience. Khrushchev basically said that Stalin had betrayed Lenin and the Bolshevik movement. The speech by Nikita was, as Taubman puts it, was the bravest and most reckless thing he ever did. It shook the communist world to its core and made Khrushchev numerous enemies, men like Voroshilov, Kaganovich, Molotov, and Malenkov, who were called out during the speech and vilified, knew that they had to take Khrushchev out. In his attack of Voroshilov, he yelled at him, Hey, you, Klim, cut out the lying. You should have done it long ago. You're old and decrepit by now. Can't you find the courage and conscience to tell the truth about what you saw with your own eyes? Voroshilov was stunned and red in the face because of the attack. Next time, we discuss the aftermath and the effects of the speech and the coming of the first foreign crisis that Khrushchev had to deal with, the Hungarian Revolution. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Uh, anybody who hasn't given me a rating on iTunes, I'd really appreciate it. It really helps move me up the rankings and gets more listeners to be aware of the podcast. Of course, you can always please, you know, just visit our fellow listeners at the Russian Rulers History Podcast Facebook group. Or go to the website at RussianRulersHistory.com where you can ask a question, leave a comment, or make a suggestion. Now, as always, das vidanya i spasiba bolshoya.